Right, well, I'm not even ready, but I've hit record now. Well, and, and this is now how the podcast starts. Yep. Because if you're going to start recording seven minutes ago, so the, like, I'm in media res without even knowing it. And no matter where I am in the media, I want to know where I am, res or not. I need to know these things. But because the show's now started, before we've even planned what we were going to do, we have to do that. We have to do admin in real time. So I've written the first order of, well, not the first order of business, but one of the orders of business that happens to be the first on the list. People sucking Miyazaki's balls. What else are we talking about on today's episode of the Trash Girl Diaries, Elsa? My four my four topics are Final Fantasies Seven Rebirth and Ten. Handy because not only have we both played Rebirth, I am currently uh, playing through Ten, so that's good. And that's why I want to talk about it. Excellent. So you've Rebirth been and playing Ten. Playing it. Uh, the the film Rebel Moon Part One: A Child of Fire. Okay. And the fact that I went to Colorado and left my Switch in an Uber car. Right, yeah, we're starting with that one, um, actually. Because you talked to me about this last night before... Um, yeah. Well, obviously before we were before we recorded this, because I just said last night. Oh, I was going to start this by talking about my... my um, the... The toys that have weaponized my own autism against me. I'm going to put that down as well. Yeah, I'm going to... Uh, mm, I'm going to buy me some of them. Right. Hang on one sec. I need to grab them. And the toys. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Aha. Last night I was at a a popular UK range of stores called The Range. Um, which is good because they do a lot of crafting stuff, which is like Fee's area of business. And they do a lot of infantile puerile tat, uh, which is where I come in. And you know me, Elsa, I like my little bits of colourful collectible crap. Your monsters in your pockets is, your boglins is. I am also absurdly autistic. So if you get a bunch of little collectible minifigs, and crossbreed them with stimming toys. Fuck me. You have all of my money. And I am sat on a podcast with a plastic scorpion that clicks. Oh. Well, if that's not perfect, I don't know what is. Listen to the clicky clicky. Why is why did my TV just turn itself on? And what is this random YouTube nonsense? Your TV just turned itself on? I don't fucking know this. I think that's how Terminator starts. Yeah. Yeah, I've been watching all sorts of random Dark Souls content and the video had stopped and it was just on YouTube's front page and then he just started randomly playing a video while I'm trying to talk about something I interrupted you to talk about <laughs> because this show is run professionally and is structured. Yeah. At a quick Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. I forgot what these things are even called. Squirkies, I think they're called. So yeah, yeah. I showed this to the the Stephanie Sterling Trash Palace Discord server last night, and since everyone there is is as neurodivergent as myself, I do feel like I've I've done something bad because everyone else was just as childishly excited about these as me. They're basically little fidget cubes that have been turned into little animals. Each one has like a couple of features off of a fidget cube. So I've got a chameleon, which is like a little cubey chameleon, and his big eyes on the side are like those spinny clacky discs. Oh, that's so good. And there's a button on his head that pokes a tongue out, and that's got a nice little like a pressy button. And what's the other one? And his tail is rubbery and curls, oh. so you can flick it open like like flick it straight and then let it ping back there's a butterfly with poppers on his wings hang on let's get some quality popping action beautiful and now i realize if you're listening to this and you're neurotypical what's happening right now is 
confusing for you. But trust me, this is QVC for the NeuroSpicy right now. It really is. <laughs> like, I'm actually uh, currently, like, because I want to keep my hands busy, right? So what I what I have is an earring. Because someone um, that I was dating at the time, this is in, like, 2019, sent me a pair of earrings uh, in the shape of... Yuna's guns from Final Fantasy X. Oh, that's cool. And they're very textured, like so. It, it, I can just feel all of the little, the little bumps and the crannies yeah. all over that. And um, it's nice to have things that are a good, a good touch. Which again mm. is one of those things where looking like one of many, many things where I look back uh, at instances in my life and I'm like, how did? nobody figure it out like how 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 did jonathan not figure it out i mean i'm so angry at him over like not diagnosing me like i've known a trained doctor of the brains for years and he never diagnosed me it had to be my husband like like i spent enough time with phoenix and then they were like oh no no you're mega autistic and then i spoke to laura and she was like oh yeah no no totally like that's a known quantity um (laughs) first of all i get along with you (laughs) um and i really you know like like, as is true for for many autistic people we get along better with with other neurodivergent people because uh the typicals don't She's trust right us <laughs> um but and yeah. i don't trust them they're no, no friends no. of mine not at you all. heard me if you don't have any sort of, of of if you don't have any mental irregularity in your patterns of thought and behavior yeah fuck off <laughs> also why are you listening to this I think the only way this podcast could be more autistic is if we started talking about Pokemon. Which, give us time, we will get there. So yes, yes, welcome to today's incredibly, incredibly neurotypical episode. So this clacky turtle. Oh, I, I it, hear it. It's got a clacky tail. And clicky shell oh. bits. So, yes, listeners, um, these are basically... Um, a new line of plastic tap that I'm excited about. Uh, a contemporary one. I'm planning to actually do a video on the current state of contemporary toys. The ones actually aimed at modern kids, not like nerd toys. But the actual things being sold to children now. Because there is quite a bit of triple ification going on. You know, obviously I never properly grew up. So whenever I'm in a shop, I will look at toys. And I have noticed like the amount of blind boxing for... Little Fuck. collectible creatures that all have incredibly similar art styles, and some of which are like a dozen toy lines that are basically the same thing with a slight gimmick twist. All of them coming from the same company. They're just churning them out. I was talking on Podquisition a couple of weeks ago about a line of toys, Squishlings or something. It was a pinata themed collectible animal thing. And it was pretty much the same thing. A lot of blind boxes, a lot of big eyed marketing 101 cute creatures neon colors neon or pastel yeah certainly a lot of pastel these days like neon was was very 90s that was me growing up was a lot of the neon whereas these days you do see a lot of the pastels which i think comes from the success of stuff like hatchimals i think a lot of these toys sort of try and and chase that particular dream fucking beanie babies and despite knowing the cynicism behind it, a lot of it still appeals to me because it's literally been designed to do that. But out of all of them, these ones I have a genuine affection for. And then there's still like that stuff to look out for. There are mystery boxes with like, you know, rares and shit. But a lot of them are also just like all of these ones. I got one mystery one that had a scorpion in it. All the others I got were like in blister packs, like just just plain in the box. You could see what you were getting. So, yeah. which is actually like recommended for something like this, where it's like they all have different stim features, and some of them appeal to people more than others. Like I really like the the little round buttons that you get, um, although they're they're attached to the jellyfish, which has squishy stims, which. I don't mind except for the fact that it picks up dirt and uh, OCD happens to be another one of my particular little brain blessings, shall we say. So that's an issue. Anyway, the long and the short of it is, listener, is that I have been playing with these little things called squirkies and 
there is a, sp a fidget spinner that is an axolotl and it's its little fins. It spins round and round and round. And I like them. And I thought I would info dump on a hyperfixation because we're a very neurotypical show here. And you know what? I'm, I actually posted about this on Tumblr last night. And this may actually be a bit too dark for the podcast. But when I was a kid, I had that uh, metaphorically stomped out of me. Um, because anytime I would info dump about a special interest that I had, I would usually be shamed for it. Yeah, yeah. So as a result, it's actually difficult for me to do that. I can do it if I mm. get excited enough, but I have to work past the guilt. Yeah. No, I totally understand it. Like, I, one of the reasons I, I followed up me talking about this with a lot of disclaimers and self-effacing jokes is I'm incredibly self-conscious about the fact I just came on here to talk about some plastic animals that I like. I totally understand that. Like, I've, I've, I don't want to get too dark because this is supposed to be like, you know, the lighter podcast that we do. But I've talked before in, in different media about my upbringing, and there was a lot of that, a lot of sort of suppression of, of one's ability to express themselves. Even just by like a neurotypical kid standards, speaking up for yourself and, and having a voice was terrifyingly discouraged. So I certainly understand that whole sort of, you know, I had my personality conditioned out of me, I guess. Um, and Phoenix was was a big part of that, like, like my partner, like, was a big part of helping me sort of come out of my shell and also, like, understand that I am autistic because that's something I just never considered of myself before. And even just, like, knowing that and understanding it gives one, I think, a bit more of a freedom to... To not mask, especially when they're amongst, like, each other. And I do enjoy that about getting to work with yourself and Laura with Podquisition and the Jimquisition subtitles. And, you know, the vast majority of folks on the Trash Palace Discord server and everything. And, you know, the people that watch the show and listen to this and everything. Like, we do have a very high uh, neurodiverse makeup in this sort of audience uh, community or whatever. It's just nice to feel safe to be able to express that and express your interests. And, you know, I think partially that's why I do the work I do. Because I can talk about little plastic animals in front of people and call it a job. For which I'm incredibly blessed. Will the Squirkies get onto uh, Stephanie Sterling's heaving toy chest then? Yeah, probably. I do want to go back to that. I, I need to work out what I'm doing with regards to video content because... Well, look at the landscape. But um, yeah. there's a lot of toy stuff I want to talk about lately. Because I've got my Squirkies. i got a Baron Kaza Micronaut over there. i got some of those other Square Enix Bright Arts figures. Because you got me that lovely oh, metal tonberry for my birthday. I sure did. Yeah. That and, um, and Kate Sith. You did, yes. Kate Sith's behind me. Um, you got me the, <sighs> the Kate Sith doll that's been featured on the Jimquisition which I adore, and the the, me the little metal mini Bright Arts Tonbury figurine, which you can see on the Jimquisition. It's on top of my um, the Brighter Pimbar arcade table that's behind me in the live action bit. And I bought to go along with that because I loved it. I got a Cactuar and Ooh. one of the little Heartless from Kingdom Hearts. Oh. If you've not seen those figures folks i talked about them, about them a bit on podquisition as well a few weeks ago but those are really good like whatever i think about square enix as a as a game publisher as a fucking toy manufacturer like you know they're still scumbags they're a company but the products are incredible they really are it, like stunning stuff as uh, you know i i'm a big toy fan toy collector and i will say like when you look at some of those big sort of higher end nerd focused makers of toys. Like I would put the stuff Square Enix is doing like easily above Necker and McFarlane. Yeah. And for the price, like better than the hot toys stuff, which is a lot more sort of expensive for the most part. Square Enix, they do have their Masterworks line, which, you know, runs into the four digits. And I think the only ones that they have so far there's one for Final Fantasy VI. It's like a statue, a really big statue of Terra and the Magitek armor. And then there's also a couple ones of the most 
marketable video game character of the past decade uh, to be. Mm. I know, people really like her. To be or not to be, that ain't a question, because the answer's always to be. I was recently playing, uh, or not playing, but thinking about playing Soul Calibur VI. The soul still burns. Transcending history and the world. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, 2B is a character in that. Mm. She is one of three guest characters alongside Geralt the Witcher Man. The man from The Witcher. Yeah, he's the Witcherman. Geralt of Riviera. Sure. Yeah. Geraldo Rivera. Uh, my old friend and then... Um... Longtime colleague Jonathan Holmes, who we've we've mentioned on on Trash Girl Diaries now and then, um, he got in a huge amount of shit once because he called Geralt Geralt in a video. Oh my god! Jonathan didn't know he he was. This was during a period we were working for a website and they were doing video reviews, but they didn't have the person who wrote the review do the video. So for this, huh. we had someone who'd written a review of The Witcher, one of The Witcher games. I don't know which one. If it was Witcher 2, it would have been my review. It might have been. Because Witcher 3, I was independent by then. Anyway, it doesn't yeah. matter. Either way, Jonathan didn't write the review that he was the one charged to read out the text for the video. And he don't give a fuck. He don't give a fuck about those games. Like, those are power fantasies with grizzled men with swords. Jonathan does not give a shit about that. He don't care yeah, what the guy's really name does. sounds like. So, of course, he's going to call him Geralt. And people got so pissed because they were like, oh, you should fire. You shouldn't have game reviewers who don't know how to pronounce the words of the characters. Uh, Jonathan's just like, hey, guilty as charged. Like, he don't give a fuck. I loved it. You know, those are the same people who fucking pronounce it Titus. It's Titus. Yeah, but I don't want to say Titus. I understand that it's Titus. I don't want to say Titus. Every instinct... Every fibre of my corporeal self, every ethereal glimmer of my non-corporeal self, aka my incorporeal self, compels me to say Titus. Well, I mean, I guess I just, I played Kingdom Hearts and I played Dissidia and those, they say Titus. I know they do. They're correct. Because... It's yes. their character. However, no. You know, speaking of that, uh, yes. isn't he from... Uh, Titus is the, the, the main one from Final Fantasy X. I hear you've been playing that. Yes, Final Fantasy X. Yes. Out of X, fuck. Oh, mate. Uh, yeah, like a... Oh, more of an eight, right? But still out of ten. No, no, Final Fantasy X, I've got a lot of affection for that. I love Final Fantasy X. Oh. Actually, as a matter of fact, thinking of, because we were talking about merch and, and tat earlier, I got something. I got something here. Hang on a second. Uh, we're on the Final Fantasy portion of the Trash Girl Diaries uh, for those um, damn right using are. their scorecards at home. All right. Now you may hear some paper. Okay. Or some plastic crinkling. I hope so. I love hearing paper and plastic. I have here... One of my favorite pieces of merch, and it pertains to, to Final Fantasy X out of X, Ooh. because it is a music box. A music box. See if I can wind it up and see if I can have it be... Yeah. It's a music box that plays uh, Xanarkand, the, yeah. the Xanarkand theme from the beginning of Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy X was my first Final Fantasy. And mm, um, while I don't know if I still think it's the best one, I will say I think it has one of the stronger openings of any Final Fantasy. You know, with the really, really pretty music, the, you know, listen to my story, this could be our last chance. And then the really, really pretty music. Yep. 
When I used to uh, do wrestling shows in Alabama, I worked for a company called Pro South Wrestling, and they would start every show by playing Otherworld in full. That is fucking awesome. Before the show starts, you will sit there and you will listen to the entirety of that fucking theme. That's fucking, oh God, I want to go to one of their shows now. Right? Because that's how you start a fucking show. One day I'm gonna, like, maybe if I ever wrestle Kid Bandit again, like, if I do a show that, like, calls for some special music, because last time I used uh, Stan Bush's The Touch as special entrance music for Kid Bandit, I think at some point I'm gonna have to come out to Otherworld. Because that's just the moment you hear... Like, I don't care what's between your legs. You have a boner if you hear that. For fucking real, though. Great oh. tune. Uh, really cool, like, intro. Like, like because it isn't just, like, that FMV with the big guitar song. But that understated opening, as you say, really pretty music. The, the Zanakin theme and everything. It's a fascinating game. Final Fantasy X is fascinating. Not the first one I played. Like, many British people my age. Seven was the first uh, taste of the series I got. Never really saw much of eight at the time. Hugely fell in love with nine, which still to this day, I don't say it's the best Final Fantasy, but nine is my favorite Final Fantasy. And then there was ten, which I spent a lot of my time playing it thinking I was hating it. Until at one point after I saw how many hours I'd logged and had seen that it was almost exactly 24, I was like, I'll tell you what, I've actually really enjoyed those 24 hours. I don't think I hate it. And that's pretty much my feelings on Final Fantasy X, is it's, it's a game I keep feeling like I should hate, but I'm quite fond of it. There is something about it, like, it, it does make a lot of very perplexing decisions. Oh, I've got complaints. <laughs> yes. I actually think that the story is paced pretty well, or at least by Final Fantasy standards. Yeah. Because uh, Final Fantasy as a series does have a tendency to stop the story dead for some random shit to happen. And mm. 10 doesn't really do that. No, um, no, it does sort of... I think it almost goes the other way. It's so businesslike at times. On this current replay, it, it really struck me how for the, like, the opening hours of the game, you spend so little time in any one place. You barely get get to know the areas you're in because I think the opening hour you're on two different boats like you are just they are jetting you from place to place yeah to the point where this time around it just sort of hit me how little I cared about the world of Spira I like the characters the story is interesting there's a lot about the narrative I'm into but the actual world and culture of Spira not only do I never feel like I get to see enough of it to care the game itself routinely tells me I shouldn't care about this culture because it's fucked. And what really hit me this time around was the bit where you go to the, the capital for the first time before you have your first proper Blitz ball game. Oh, uh, Luca. Luca, yeah. And um, Yuna mentions to Tidus how there aren't many big cities like this because there's no point. Because once a lot of people gather, sin comes and fuck, fucking ruins everything. And I, I just like was like, God... For as colourful as this game is, this is this goes beyond bleak. This is just these poor fuckers who only have Blitzball for entertainment. That's it. That's what you yeah. just said. That's all that they've got. Waka says that at one point. Yeah. A few islands and shitty swimming pool football. That's it. That is such a horrible world. I want Sin to destroy it. For their own good, it's miserable. Oh, so you're, you're hashtag Team Seymour then? Uh, well, I mean, have you seen his hair? Pitiful mortal, your hope ends here, and your meaningless existence with it! Oh, Seymour. Seymour. I think that's another problem I have with Ten. One of the things I enjoy the most about Final Fantasy games is the villain. I'm a big fan of villains in media anyway. Like, I always find them interesting. It, like, flawed characters I find inherently interesting, and they often have the biggest flaws. And Final Fantasy has a lot of really cool, memorable, interesting, intriguing villains. 
Final Fantasy X has a blob of sea goo. It's just ocean throw up. A big space whale. And Seymour, who at times is a really interesting character. And at other times is performed by a man who seems to be nervous to use his mouth. He's got a great voice, but the delivery is meek. Yeah, like, it it feels like they're trying to go for, like, breathy and sort of ethereal and intimidating in its weirdness. He's kind of effete, is Seymour. Yeah. Having said that, Final Fantasy X to me is one of the games where, and I don't think it's alone in this, where the heroes are much more intricate and there's more nuance to the heroes than the villains. Mm -hmm. That's not always the case in Final Fantasy games. I would say that that's definitely not the case in a lot of the more recent ones. In Final Fantasies 15 and 16, the hero is one of the less interesting characters in the story. Mm -hmm. I'd be hard-pressed to find someone in Final Fantasy 16, for instance, who was more boring than Clive. Clive is kind of boring, as, as characters go. Are you sure? Because I expect dynamism and exciting thrill rides from a medieval fantasy hero called Clive. I just expect him to spend the whole game sat in a corner with some tea. Some, like, milky, shitty tea that probably cost, like, a pound for a box. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he got it from Iceland, from the Econo range. Depots. I mean, I have a problem with villains in games in general. I've talked about this before, and one day I'm going to do just like a full fucking angry video about it. So many villains these days are just generic sludge. They're the corruption or the darkness or the whatever. There's traces of that in 16, but at least they use it a bit interesting. They're not the villain. They're the catalyst for a lot of the other villainy you see. Yeah, because like 16 has a lot of villains in it. Yes, well, they go full Game of Thrones, like... They really with all do. Over. Fuck. But, like, Final Fantasy XV, I would say that the villain is much more interesting than the hero, because Noctis just kind of does what he's supposed to. Mm-hmm. He's got a magic sword and a destiny, and he, he's super on board with that, whereas Arden has a lot more going on. Yeah, yeah. And, and just a beautiful scenery-chewing performance from Arden as well, it has God, to be said. He's... Darren DePaul just crushed it. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I would say that the, the inverse is true for Final Fantasy X. I, I like Seymour as an antagonist. To me, Seymour is just kind of the natural end point of the institution that is the real villain of FF10. The theocracy. Of, yeah, the of whole Yevon. Like, Yevon thing, yeah. Yeah, and Seymour is more a product of that. He's more the monster they created, kind of like Sephiroth is for Shinra. Yeah. Well, the thing about Ten is conceptually, everything in it is great, I think. I think all of the concepts are, are really cool. The bits where it fails are just on executing some of that. I agree, like the, the concept of Seymour, the idea of him as a product of that systemic villainy is great. And, and that is present. Like, I'm not saying like the game doesn't make strides towards that, but... In a series that has given us the likes of Kuja and Sephiroth and X-Death and Kefka and like all of these like big sort of memorable villains, Sin and Seymour as the faces of, of this game's villainy were just... It was a personal letdown for me as someone who is very much into Final Fantasy villains. And that, I think that was probably one of the biggest reasons I felt I didn't like the game as much as I did. Because I was still loving all the game parts of it, but... I spent a lot of time thinking, oh, Sin is so boring, and Seymour is not much better. Despite the fact that, you know, the combat, despite being more simplistic as a turn-based thing than ATB, was actually so really fucking good. Yeah, I really love the combat in Final mm-hmm. Fantasy X. As long as we're talking about Final Fantasy X, there are a few characters I feel particularly compelled to talk about. I'll, I'll get the easy one out of the way. Mm-hmm. I was 14 when I first played Final Fantasy X and was introduced to Lulu. Yeah. Yeah. At at which point puberty just hit me like a truck. Good Lord. And judging by your presence on this podcast, 
you've been drawn to big titty goth girls ever since. Ain't that the fucking truth? Do you get it? I'm saying my tits are huge. Oh my god, if you could pull together a Lulu cosplay, I would lose my shit. I would just, oh my god, I would regain the ability to come. <laughs> <laughs> These days, because I have self-esteem, and the whole fat people making fat jokes about themselves to try and defend themselves from the fat phobes who will still just make fun of them anyway thing is something I don't agree with these days. Like, I don't like making fat jokes about myself unless they're really good. Which is why I'm going to say for this one, I can't do a Luna costume, a Lulu costume, because it's fucking hard enough getting one belt that fits me. (laughs) It's a quality joke. Well, the thing is, if you put have them all just vaguely encircling your thighs then i think if i just get a normal black dress and then like a glue gun and just glue strips of leather to it it'll look like a final fantasy costume if not lulu another one definitely 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 so yes this is back when you could still come so lulu was was obviously of great interest at that time Yep, uh, she is one of two characters in video games that I, I I jokingly say just pushed me over the line into puberty. Or luberty in this case. Ha! <laughs> ha! <laughs> Lube. Lube. The other is Morrigan uh, from Darkstalkers. Ah, that, a classic. Although I mostly know her from Marvel vs. Capcom, but she is a Darkstalkers character. Huge fan of hers. I have other things to say about Lulu, but I don't know if I've told you this. I know I've told other people this. There is a character in Final Fantasy X who I, I refer to as my favorite character in anything. Like, my, my number one best one from any piece of media. I'm hoping it's the old man in that long road who's like, Ah, oh, Spira. Machen the Scholar? When Meehan built this road so many years ago... At your service, milady. You remember when he talks about the shoe puff? There's a bit where he talks about the shoe puff and uses the word schnoz, and it is a thing of beauty. I think what I might do tonight before I go to bed is just like find a YouTube video of like all of his voice lines and just set that to loop <laughs> and just fall asleep <laughs> listening to him. Ah, Lady Yoda. That's the one. Best kept. Huh? That's the one. Was that the the one? It's Yuna. Oh, Yuna. Yes. It's Yuna. I am much fonder of Yuna as portrayed in Final Fantasy X-2 than Final Fantasy X. She was allowed to have a personality in X-2. And also, like, Final Fantasy X-2 is great because amid all of the... It, it does a lot more world building, so you may want to revisit it. Yeah, I played ten two not long after it came out. I... Liked it. I didn't get mega far. I saved in a dungeon. It didn't seem like I could get out, and there was just a boss fight, and I couldn't beat them. And I I felt like I was in a a genuinely unwinnable situation, and I never went back. Well, Final Fantasy X-2, though, um, amid all of the world building and amid the new existential threat, Mm. ultimately it's about a person trying to figure out who she wants to be, in a world she did not expect to live to see. Yeah. Which is a great, like, narrative conceit. It is. It's great. And also, I've had this uh, this headcanon for a very long time. But if you view Final Fantasies X and X-2 through the, the lens of Yuna being trans... As every piece of media should be viewed. Yes. You, and the thing is, like, I don't have trans headcanons about every single character... Yeah. I do have a trans headcanon, though, for Final Fantasy X, that it is required to be trans if you want to be a summoner. And if you interpret Seymour as trans, and Yuna as trans, and every other summoner, I guess, and also Titus, but that's unrelated, they become more interesting characters. The whole game becomes more interesting if you just add more queerness to a lot of the characters. I mean, every form of media would be. Yuna, right, is yeah. half regular person, I guess, half default person, and half Albed. 
Yeah. Not a lot of people know that. Even people who are close to her don't know that mm. about her, right? So she passes. Seymour does not. Like, Seymour is also half default person and half something else. He's half Guado, the weird tree people with the long fingers. And he is not able to hide that fact. Yeah. Dressed like a weirdo, strange, confusing voice, taller than everyone else, doesn't pass. I find Seymour suddenly way more relatable. My theory is actually that he's a trans man. Oh, okay. And I feel the same way about Titus. Titus and Seymour are both trans men in my mind. Okay. That actually has the interesting side effect of making Jet less of an irredeemable bastard. Because, you know, say what you want about the way he treats his kid, at least he doesn't misgender him. That's true. <laughs> and, like, you can see a, a, a fucked up lens through which... Jack is trying to help Titus. If if you interpret Titus as trans, right? Yeah. Jack's like whole, like, well, you know, you endure these hardships and that's what makes you a man. Like, it's fucked up. But, like, at least in his mind, he's doing something that will help later. So it's the gender equivalent of making a kid smoke an entire pack of cigarettes so they never want to smoke again. Correct. Yeah, he's just making... Titus go through an entire pack of masculinity. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, like, so, so because Yuna, you know, passes and Seymour doesn't and all of the negative stigma that comes with that. And as a result, you know, Seymour is angry and vengeful. Whereas Yuna, who, you know, grew up in a relatively peaceful environment, um, you know, with a support structure, She's gentler. She's yeah. kinder. And then she realizes that the system is completely fucked shortly around the time that she gets laid for the first time. Mm-hmm. In a lake. Yeah. I mean, good for you, girl, but Jesus Christ, why did you fuck the guy in a lake? I mean... Final Fantasy games have the weirdest places for their characters to fuck. It's like a lake in 10, on some rocks under an airship in 7... A beach in sixteen. Just use a bed. Just, just, just once. I know. I I know it's like like a fictional thing, but you still have beds in Final Fantasy worlds. Just use one of them. For real. Yeah. For fucking real. I'm all for adventurous fucking. Not necessarily for me. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to do that. I'm too disabled. To fucking have sex in some of the places I see people having sex. I'm like, I ain't fucking getting up there. Even if I do, I'll be too fucking tired to to get me up there. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I mean, I could talk about Final Fantasy X for hours. This is one of the ones I've really poured over. Like, it's up there with 13 and 14 and 1 for that. Yeah. I have really given Final Fantasy X some thought. And I'm glad that you're replaying it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. It's been fun to replay Throughout last year, I was playing some of the older Final Fantasies with the Pixel remasters and that. And my tag team partner, Priscilla, Queen of the Ring, has also been going through the Final Fantasies and had recently finished 9, was about to pick up 10, and then I, I was talking to her about 10 and was like, shit, I, I've talked about it enough that I need to replay it now. So, yeah, past couple of days, been going through it. I'm not mega far in yet. I think I'm... Just before the point where the Crusaders were about to like launch that big assault on um, Sin from the cliffs and that. Oh, Operation Mehan. Yeah, it was after that one of the scenes with Seymour that I actually do really like when they're talking about them using the forbidden machines and that. And then Seymour's like, pretend you didn't see them. Begging your pardon, but that's not something a maester should say. Pretend I didn't say it. That bit was good. There's lots of lovely moments when mm -hmm. Titus finds out what's going to happen to Yuna, the big fight before Yuna Lesko and Oron does that big speech. Like some of this is stuff I've not seen since I played it in like whenever that came out, like 2002, whatever it was. And yet, for someone like me who who has like major memory issues, parts of that game are just burned in my head because they were just delivered that well. Before we move on, because I do think we should. We've got other things to discuss. I do want to talk about Waka briefly as a character. Um, because mm -hmm. he gets a bum rap, and I think he's a great character. I think he's an amazing character, because 
you know, I'm from the South. I grew up in the South and bigotry in certain places is systemic. It cannot be avoided because of just how pervasive it is. And if you stay in that one place for a really long time, like me or like Waka does, because he's in Besaid for almost all of his life. Yeah. And all it really takes for him to to at least begin to overcome his bigotry is for him to realize that the objects of his fear and malice are people. Yeah. Like, all it takes is for him to bond with Riku. And then there comes a point where um, Albed, the Albed um, home is massacred by uh, the forces of Yevon. And Riku sees, like, all of her countrymen dead. And the first person she runs to for comfort is Waka, who, like, just puts his arms around her. Like, and, yeah. and, and it's that point where he becomes, like, sort of a big brother to her. And I guess, like I said, I, you know, grew up in the South, bigotry, very pervasive in the South. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I spent 14 years there. You sure did. Yeah. So you know. Mm-hmm. You know I've this. seen it. I mean, hell, I grew up with, like, I mean, my dad was pretty fucking bigoted and a lot of bigotry and shit is normalized and socialized in schools and things yeah. i'm i can't pretend i mean fuck like my early career is well known what a, a fucking edgelord offensive dickhead i was politically and in terms of what i thought was acceptable to say and how to treat people i was a very very different person i like Waka as well i like his story i like the character development but it is always a big risk when you have a character member in your party who is racist. Yeah. Even after they reform, it's hard to get over that first impression. As it is in real life, I mean, there are plenty of people who, like, are fans of mine now who were like, I was turned off you for years because I saw your early stuff because you were such a cunt. And that's a hard thing to get over, and I don't... As I've always said, like, I don't expect anyone to forget that. But it is a difficult thing because while a story about bigotry being overcome by just simple experience is important, and I do, you know, fully believe that a lot of of bigots can be rehabilitated because it is just pure ignorance and how they were conditioned. And it's funny, you use that word, and that's, that's that's what I think is important. Because, I mean, the thing is, when you first meet Waka, right... That's not the first thing you learn about him. The first thing you learn about him is that he likes Blitzball and he seems to be a genuinely nice guy. Mm -hmm. He's kind. He's charitable, even. But another thing about Waka is not only is he ignorant, he's stupid. Yes. Like, he he is a stupid person. And Final Fantasy XIII does this as well with Snow, a character who is also stupid. It's presented as a character flaw. And not necessarily one that can be overcome. You know, it's like Ron White said, you can't really fix stupid. But the fact that it is written as a character flaw and not played for laughs, as someone who I consider myself to not be particularly intelligent, I struggle with comprehension of a lot of things. And there's just, and I'm also just uneducated. Seeing a character like Waka or like Snow, who does their best to circumvent that particular flaw, just really resonated with me yeah and it, it it does to this day i i'm very grateful yeah that's great like genuine just just yeah solid sentiment and that is valuable to have especially in games where we you know the best we can hope for is is fantasy racism getting discussed because so few game developers are bold enough to discuss real racism but even then when we get the fantasy racism it's usually just so poorly done like it is in Final Fantasy 16. Yes, it's poorly done, it misses the point, or it's cowardly, or just something. So it is important that we have these stories, and it is important that we have this message that a lot of people with bigoted viewpoints aren't irredeemable. They're just misled, and some of them are just stupid. Um, yeah, some of them are just stupid. And, and like you can teach, and you can educate, and a lot of the time like these people just need to be shown yeah the big problem when you do that in a game like this though where you have an rpg and a party of team members who over time we're all supposed to you know as we do with waka we see those flaws give way to 
more strengths that come out through the power of friendship TM. And that's all great, but when it comes to something like rehabilitating a bigot, credibility for that rehabilitation comes with a long time of effort and work. And even then, it's not unreasonable for someone to not forgive someone for their bigotry. So when you have a character who goes from racist to not racist, just over the course of a few hours, I think that is what makes it a harder pill to swallow. And that's why even after they've had the character development, it's still hard not to think of hates Al Bed as one of Waka's defining character traits. If I'm making sense. No, that does make sense. That makes a lot of sense. I don't see it as he starts out racist and ends not racist. I think he starts racist and then realizes, oh shit, I'm racist. I really got to do something about this. But like, you got to take it on faith that Waka, because he's a nice person and because, you know, he may be stupid, but he isn't, he isn't arrogant. He has that necessary humility. You kind of have to take it on faith that he's moving in a positive direction. You do. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like Spira itself at the end of Final Indeed. Fantasy X. You, you need to take it on faith that, that things are going to be okay. Yeah. The healing process begins at the end of the story. Dana Warrior did try that for her husband, though, as well. Didn't quite work. After he died. Yeah. After he died is the thing. Look, I know Ultimate Warrior said that all of you like gay people should fuck off and burn, right? But he was sorry. He didn't say it in public. I heard it. And he looked at me when he said it, which proves it. I think it can be hard for an audience to come around that quickly to someone if they're displaying odious behaviour. <laughs> Sorry, um, now I'm just imagining Waka cutting an Ultimate Warrior promo. <laughs> just Waka <laughs> just rolling up. <laughs> Destrucity! <laughs> oh, Hulk Hogan! I will teach you how to blitz. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. And they never won again until Tevis showed up. Indeed. Speaking I have of had. Final. F- yes. Hmm? Oh, no, it doesn't matter. We'll move on. I was just going to say, I've had a bunch of Final Fantasy X tunes, like, stuck in my head at once while we've been talking about X. Because I had uh, Besaid's theme going for a while, then the regular battle theme. Now I've got Auron's theme in my head. Um, you know what, let's just, like, this is just the Final Fantasy X episode now. I recently went to a concert, uh, where they play Final Fantasy music in a, like, a symphony setting. Mm-hmm. They played three songs from Final Fantasy X, one of which was Besaid's theme, which is just, like, that, that in particular really takes me back. Like, that's, that's one of those nostalgic tunes. For yeah. Me. They also had a version of the last Seymour fight performed by a string quartet and it is amazing fucking incredible i have bought like a whole bunch of the cds for that and everything it yeah it's good shit nice one speaking of making the game queerer and having it make more sense Aaron, right the character Aaron, he's a shithead <laughs> yeah Aaron's a complete shithead like he is a, an unnecessarily cryptic unnecessarily dismissive and unemotive prick. Yes. And that's the key word, though, is unnecessarily. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the thing, right? A lot of his effort is spent toward rehabilitating Titus's father. He really wants Titus to not hate Jekt so much. My personal interpretation of that, of the reason why that is, and even the reason why Aaron is... A ghost. Spoilers for a game that came out in 2001, but Oren's a ghost. Is that he's in love with Jack. I mean, it makes sense. Like, given everything we see, like... Yeah, it makes so much more sense if you interpret Oren is trying to rehabilitate Jack's image in the eyes of his son because Oren is in love with Jack. Yeah. Honestly, like, 
the moment you said it, I just was like, yeah, of course. Like, to the point where I think if I found out Auron wasn't in love with Jekt, I'd be more surprised. Right? Yeah. I mean, he has old, tired, gay energy anyway. Like, old gay man who's fucking done. You know what, though? He's my age. Eh? Huh? Auron is 35 years old. Oh, yeah, I forgot that we're, we're dealing with uh, Final Fantasy where age and... <laughs> <laughs> appearance inhabit completely different planes of reality. He's 35. I'm five years older than Oren. Yep. Oh, Jesus. Like, no, the only playable character I can think of in a Final Fantasy game who is 40 uh, is Saz from 13. Sake. Yeah, I'll tell you what's so funny about it as well, is the older I get, the more I play games like Final Fantasy, and I look at these heroes... And I'm like, you're 20 fucking two? You haven't <laughs> lived. Like, you you don't have opinions I can respect yet. You're that <laughs> inexperienced at life. And I'm supposed to buy that you, a 22-year-old, are a highly trained assassin? Fuck off. Cloud is 21. Anyone? He's not. You can't be. Sid Highwind is thirty-two. That one, the Sid thing, drives me up the fucking wall. He should not be thirty-two. Barrett being thirty-six tracks. Just about, yeah. Aerith is twenty-two. I see all of these games. Final Fantasy is a big sort of perpetrator of this, the trope of the incredibly young hero. It just gets harder and harder to believe, and. In games that have giant planet-born weapons and monsters and, and summonable Norse gods, the idea that a 21-year-old is in a position of responsibility and is not fucking it up is the least believable thing in the world to me. For real. Like, I could go on, like, Squall, 18, Tidus, 17, Noctis, 20, Lightning, 21. And if they were anywhere near how they should be at that age, they'd be unrelatable. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to relate to them. So, you know, I'm glad that the the 21-year-old is acting like a (laughs) 45-year-old divorced mechanic. Like, because, yeah, I can understand that. (laughs) You know, if if they were actually, like, playing their appropriate age then yeah i wouldn't understand it i'd just be like spending hours playing it just turning to fear every now and then being like what's a skibbity what's a riz i don't understand these words (laughs) so yeah i am glad that uh (laughs) the 21 year olds don't act like 21 year olds but sometimes you actually do have characters who act their age in final fantasy games and a lot of the time it's the teenagers like Yuffie, right? Yuffie from Final Fantasy VII and and as seen in Rebreak and Rebirth. 16. Yeah, like, certainly by the standards of, like, media representation of characters. Absolutely. 16, that works. That tracks. It's about the only one that does. Riku from Final Fantasy X uh, is 15. But the thing about Riku, though, is that she's also very competent. That's the thing about Riku that I that I find interesting. Riku is a teenager, but she's a highly competent teenager. She's very practical. Someone I used to date pointed this out that like, yeah, of course she is. She is a woman of color who has, you know, been marginalized her entire life. And as a result, she needed to learn how to live pretty quickly because the only alternative was to die. When I was a kid, you know, a lot of the 15-year-old black girls I knew who were on top of their shit because they had to be. Mm -hmm. Because of just the circumstances of their lives. They won't be forgiven for making mistakes that other people will be. Yeah. Riku would not be forgiven for making a mistake that Waka made. Yes. Any of the 15 mistakes Waka makes on any given day, she couldn't make one of them. For fucking real. Good lord. That's part of... Final Fantasy X is Waka learning to understand his own privilege. Mm -hmm. And he gets there, eventually. Yeah. I haven't talked about the colours of the characters playing the racists and the the targets of racism. So you wanted to talk about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth as well? I do. 
Mm-hmm. I do because uh, I I have st- I have not finished it. I am currently at hour ninety four of Final Fantasy <laughs> Seven know. Rebirth, and I have not finished it. Yeah, I was in the nineties when I wrapped up. Yeah, this is one of the most content dense single player games I have ever played in my life. It's not quite as content dense as like Final Fantasy X two is because ten two is a lot like Rebirth in that there is just mini games all over the fucking shop, but Jesus Christ, there is so much in this game. I love almost all of it. I'm not a huge fan of the piano bits, but I don't have to do those. The piano stuff is so... The thing is, is when it works, it's actually really satisfying to use those sticks that way. But they're not designed to cope with what the game wants them to do. So it really does work that way. So it's like, when it works, it's like, I can see why they wanted to do it this way. But the other 90% of the time, I don't know why they wanted to do it that way. Yeah. And it sucks because those piano covers of the songs are all gorgeous. All of them. The Chocobo one, where it's where it's just... da 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 yeah that piano version of the chocobo theme is the perfect encapsulation of the final fantasy 7 rebirth experience in that it starts off as something more or less recognizable and then goes completely off the fucking rails and leaves you confused yep and i love it yeah also can we talk about how i'm not one of those people who didn't like kate sith and final fantasy 7 I loved Kate Sith in Final Fantasy VII. Mm-hmm. But holy shit, I love Kate Sith in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. And you made a whole video about how great Kate Sith is. I did indeed, yeah. The rehabilitation of Kate Sith. Including not pretending like his name isn't pronounced Kate Sith. Yeah, everyone knows that his name's pronounced Titus. <laughs> the next time I play through FF7, I'm going to name Kate Sith Titus. <laughs> Or cat shit. This also would be good. You did that in a video once. One of your, like, top ten parodies. Oh, where wow. Where you did a uh, top ten Final Fantasy characters, and one of them was cat shit. Brilliant. Yeah, I vaguely remember using the term cat shit now. That's all I remember. You got a better memory of my stuff than I do. I probably watch it more than you do. You probably watch it, then. I was on a... I was actually, you know, I was in Denver, and I was on a date with a lady who told me that one of the ways that she gauges the compatibility of a prospective partner is to show them your video of the top 10 characters you would love to wank off in a public toilet. (laughs) And she's like, but I don't need to do that with you because I know you've already seen it. That's love, I think. And that's what we, we wanted this show to be, you know, to discuss the whole time, that that is what love is, is, is if... You are a fan of my work. You deserve love. Yes. That's the message. And I'm not going to say, you know, that that vice versa is also true. But if I have said one thing, then it stands to reason that logically um, related subjects might have, have other meanings as well. But if you're a fan of my work, you deserve love. And you deserve to be allowed. Well said. Mm-hmm. Did the date go well? Oh, yeah. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. It it went very well. This was a week ago. Over the course of that weekend, Jesus Christ, I ate a lot of hot dogs. I ate like twelve hot dogs that weekend. That's a lot of hot dogs. I like hot dogs. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. God, I I loved remake, and the fact that Rebirth is. Just doubling down on how fucking out there and bizarre and absurd this project is going to be. I don't know how they're going to raise the stakes for the last one. (laughs) (laughs) What I like is the fact that we know they will. Like, they will find a way to somehow... And I, I have every confidence in this now. I very rarely make confident predictions about what a game's gonna be like. But they have my trust two games in now and i trust the wheel to them and given just how masterfully they have created a game 
that is a train wreck of nonsense, I have every confidence that the next one will up the ante and leave me even more confused. You know what? I bet that Kenny Omega will just be there. <clears throat> he, It's just going to be him. The last boss fight is going to take place at Wrestle Kingdom. Brilliant. Oh, God. Kenny Omega would cream his jeans if he was in a Final Fantasy game. He really, really would. Especially because he already did that. Did you see his entrance from Wrestle Kingdom whenever it was? I've seen him come out with a one-winged angel kind of thing. Bef- I mean, he's literally yeah. got a finisher called the one-winged angel. Oh, fucking nerd. I love that fucking finisher. People who name their wrestling finishing moves after like video game references are pathetic. Yeah. Take it from me, the master of the Planet Cracker. Is the Planet Cracker from a video game? Mm-hmm. It's a Dead Space reference. Oh. Yeah, that's how they strip mine planets, is they basically frack them with big uh, spacecraft called Planet Crackers. And yeah, that's that's what I named my, my double-handed sit-out choke bomb wrestling finisher move. Uh, it's named after I didn't that. know that, that that was a reference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm pathetic. For the record, when I was planning on getting into wrestling, I had a plan to have a, a finishing move that was not a video game reference. Fuck. I know, right? Is that I'm, possible? I'm very cool. You gotta understand. Because, you know, Finn Balor used to have a finishing move called the 1916, and I was going to use a similar elevated DDT and call it the 1312. Nice. I had this whole gimmick planned where I was just going to be, like, an aggressively political person <clears throat> and like actually like openly profess to being an anti-fascist and all these things because final fantasy has taught me that subtlety is for cowards oh yeah yeah subtlety illusion innuendo metaphor and all of that can fuck off for fucking real though anyway let's talk about how final fantasy 13 is a metaphor for the trans experience I mean, let's do that. <laughs> I was kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. What we should probably talk about instead is Miyazaki. Hidetaka Miyazaki and how people need to get his testicles out of their mouths. They're probably soggy at this point. Yeah. I'm not going to make a big deal of this. Although one day I might. But as I said earlier, I've been watching a lot of random Dark Souls content because I... I have had a hankering for Dark Souls recently, but I've been too fucking lazy to actually want to play it. So, you know, I've had some of the heavy hitters playing. Yeah, yeah, Vati Vidyas. Yeah, Illusory Walls. Zully the Witch. Like, all the big Dark Souls content makers. And a whole bunch of other randoms. You know, top 10 smelliest Dark Souls bosses. Okay, that that is thoughtless content I can just shove into my head. And one thing I found watching the various... Top 10 lists and hidden secret videos and, and speed runs and just stop sucking Miyazaki's balls. Have some dignity. He's one man and he's not God. Every little thing that someone likes about one of these games, they will credit Miyazaki with it. Every little line that's written, every little joke, and they'll be like, good one, Miyazaki. And I'm like, mate, Yes, he's the game director. Yes, he came up with the lion's share of this shit. But as I've said about Kojima and fucking David Cage, they are not the sole creators of these huge games with with hundreds and hundreds of developers working on them. And I am all for giving a director, like, do you credit as, like, the driving force of a project? But don't attribute everything to them. And don't keep talking about them like they are a god. Like, people do. They will talk about Miyazaki in these videos like he's a trickster god. That they fear and adore. And I'm like, he's just a man. It's not just Miyazaki. And and I don't mean this as an insult to the directors of these games. They do deserve a huge amount of credit. They are the lion's share of the driving force. But a lot of the ideas in these games are not theirs. And that's not a slight. It's just these are big team projects. There's often we hear these stories about, uh, you know, this cute thing that people loved in this game. This artist just did that on a weekend as an extra project and it was fun, so they put it in. But to a lot of these content creators, they'll see that and their instant thought will just be, nice one, Miyazaki, and move on. Yep. And I have this real problem with game directors getting treated like they're solo creators. That's what it comes down to. 
Miyazaki is not a solo creator. He is a director and as such responsible for so much of what makes the Souls games fucking good. And he is responsible for a lot of the storytelling and the world building and all of that. But From Software has hundreds of people in it. And those games are made by a lot of people. You know what that reminds me of, actually? Mm. It's the way I hear people talking about Zack Snyder. Yeah. And the thing is, I haven't met any of these people firsthand. I just, I hear about them a lot. It's kind of like those obnoxious Rick and Morty fans in that respect. I've never met these people, probably because I've never spent enough time on Reddit. But I keep hearing that that Zack Snyder has this cult following of people who think that he is an omnipotent genius. And I was thinking about that a lot when I was watching his most recent movie, Rebel Moon, Part 1, A Child of Fire. It's a lot of words. Yep. I think you can just call it Rebel Moon. Rebel Moon, yeah, that that's quicker, isn't it? I watched it just because Sophia Batella is the star, and mm-hmm. I will watch any old shit with Sophia Batella in it. I just really like her, and I think she's very, very pretty, because I'm just a useless lesbian like that. Gosh, Sophia Batella is so pretty. She's as pretty as Angela White, in a completely different way. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I was I was unfamiliar with Sophia Vitella, so I was just uh, educating myself. Mm. Uh, she was in Kingsman, The Secret Service, oh. where she played the dragon to the big bad. She was the lady with sword feet. She was in Atomic Blonde, where she played the love interest to Charlize Theron, which was wonderful to see. She's been in a few things. She was the star of Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon. It's funny because, like, when a Zack Snyder movie comes out and some pe- and people outside of his cult actually like it, it's always attributed solely to him. And when a movie comes out that people outside of his cult don't like, as is the case with Rebel Moon, it's always solely blamed on him. I mean, that's definitely an example of the sword cutting both ways. In the the buck stops with the director, uh, as well as all the credits starting with them. Yeah. But you know what? If I was Zack Snyder, I'd probably be okay with the exchange. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I reckon he's doing okay out of that exchange of of blame and credit. I'd say so. Yeah. But Rebel Moon, it's really interesting because it feels like a video game. It has the pacing of one. Yeah, this is Zack Snyder film. They go to a place, they meet a person, they add them to the party, back on the ship, next planet, new party member, they do the thing that they do, back on the ship, next planet. They repeat this like four times, five times, and then once they've gathered the entire party for the big climactic fight, the movie just ends. Oh. See you next year. Ugh. It sounds like something I shouldn't bother watching until all the bits are out. Yeah, probably. And I I might even go so far as to wait for the director's cut, because for some reason this fucking Netflix film has a director's cut. What? Yeah. Oh, don't get me... I'm not going to get on my fucking high horse about the movie industry right now and how things like that have been weaponized, but my fucking god. I tell you what, though, I did finish watching the uh, Fallout TV show last night. How'd you feel about it? Uh, Myself and Phoenix really blitzed through it in, like, two days. I really liked it. I tell you what, right? It really made me appreciate the fact that I'm barely on Twitter anymore. (laughs) Because I briefly looked at Twitter... Like, five minutes into watching episode one, immediately saw, like, nerds whining and then just turned Twitter off and yeah. enjoyed the TV show, which is very enjoyable. It's fucking funny as fuck. It's got a really cool original story. Oh, cool. Like, it's not super reliant on retreading stuff from the games. There's plenty of references and stuff, but it's not one big, long, circus fun ride of, of game references. It's not just fanboy shit. There's this really cool story about taking this person to this place. 
and lots of interconnected characters with all their little stories. There's bits of it I'm not fond of. The amount of flashbacks I could do without. But I am always happy to see Walton Goggins in anything. Um, I think he's a great actor. Uh, he plays the ghoul in, in the Fallout show, and he's fantastic in it. He was great in Hateful Eight. Vice Principals is the thing I first saw him in, and that was fun. But yeah, yeah, he's a great actor, and he's really good in this. All the all the actors are really fun. I didn't expect the plotline set in the vault to be as good as it is, huh. but all the stuff that's in Vault 33 is fucking brilliant. It's one of those shows where you're like, you keep having to watch the next show because you're constantly wondering where they're going with it. And you're loving what you're watching, but you're constantly like, I don't quite see where this is leading. And I need to. They really nailed that. So it's been a long time since I've watched anything that made me feel compelled because I had to get to the mystery of it. And it's... uh, Any one episode makes me laugh more than any one of Bethesda's Fallout games. Like, all of them put together versus one episode of the TV show. Not that, like, I want to just use the show to have a go at Bethesda, but fuck, it's a funny show. I would use any excuse to have a go at Bethesda. I can count the number of Bethesda games I have played and enjoyed on one hand. Two. (laughs) Yeah. The Elder Scrolls Three Morrowind. I like Morrowind. Mm -hmm. And The Elder Scrolls Online. I I like The Elder Scrolls Online. That is. The thing about The Elder Scrolls Online that I love is that it is, holy fuck, if ever there was a video game that was exactly what it says on the tin. It's like, you like The Elder Scrolls? You want to play it online? This is that. This is nothing more or less than that. It, it, It could have been a mod. But it's pretty good. Or at least it was when I played it. But that was a decade ago, so who knows now. Yeah, I've not played it since it was new. I don't remember being mega taken by it. And that's the problem with MMOs. You have to love it. You can't just like it. Yeah. You, yeah. Like, they're too much of a... I mean, that's, you know, why I keep talking about how unsustainable live services and all that are, because they're trying to sell every game as one that people love more than any other game, and that doesn't work. Yeah. But anyway, point is, the Fallout TV show is shockingly good far out i might actually watch it well written well acted and genuinely like every episode has made me laugh out loud at least once quality jokes going on it's on amazon isn't it it is yes huh well that'll that'll probably give me something to watch until the next season of the boys comes out Mm. if you do watch it there's a certain line about chickens and as soon as you hear it you will understand why it (laughs) It made me burst out laughing for ages. That just makes me think that someone in in a vault uniform just says, raise the chicken. Eat the (laughs) chicken. Lower the chicken. Now, Elsa, it is time to start winding down, I think. Are you going to be okay talking about Colorado? Am I going to be okay talking about Colorado? Yes. Because that was really fucking shitty. What, losing my Switch? Yeah. Mm. You lost your Switch in Colorado. In an Uber car. Yeah, and the thing is, it had all of my Switch games in like a little, one of those little carrying cases. That's what it was in. Yeah. It was in that. So my copies of multiple games, chiefly the Final Uh. Fantasy Pixel remasters, which if I wanted to replace would probably run me anywhere between 70 and 100 fucking US dollars. Not mm-hmm. to mention the Switch itself, which even if I just go for a Switch Lite, which I'm willing to do, would run me like 200. So I'm I'm staring down a $300 cost at minimum. Fuck. I um so sorry. And and the thing is, this isn't the kind of expense that I would feel super comfortable asking for, like, help with from other people. Because I feel like, you know, I have a job. I'll just save up like a normal person, you know? Having said that, listeners, if you do have money that you want to throw in my general direct, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I mean, fuck it. Put your fucking donate link out there. Yeah, like, sure, why not? 
uh, you know, I'll post it on the Discord. Why not? You know, just understand that it's it's not necessary. But yeah, I have a Venmo and a PayPal. So if you'd like to donate to the <laughs> Elsa made an extremely stupid mistake for which she is wholly responsible and, you know, doesn't want to suffer the consequences any longer than, than or as long as, for as long as she really should. If you want to donate to that. If the story of Waka has taught us anything, it's that you deserve a second chance. Even if you did a stupid thing. Oh, that's true. Especially if you have the best overdrive in the game. Yeah. I'm not one to judge anyone, like, for losing things either. Like, I literally, like, will put down some keys and as soon as they're gone from my hand, they've, I've forgotten where they are. Having ADHD is a terrifying nightmare. I will use the flashlight on my cell phone to look for my cell phone. Yep. I have adjusted my glasses to help me better find my glasses before. Fuck. ADHD. It's the best. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I laugh a minute. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. This reunion, to use a term from Final Fantasy VII, this reunion has been very, very fun. And very pleasant. And you, as always, are, are a delight. I am merely trying to match the energy of my co-host. Oh. You see how I turned that round? You see how, you see how I smoothed that? Oh, oh my god. No, you, you don't need to charm me any further. I'm already naked. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And on that bombshell, listeners... On that bombshell. Is there anything else you'd like to to leave the listeners with? Any other lingering thoughts or suggestions or advice or anything like that? Nah, I got nothing. Nah, I'm gonna go. Nah, I'm gonna go keep nah. playing Rebirth. I have multiple Chocobo yeah. races to win. I'm going to go back to my little clicky animals. Oh, God. It's, see, as soon as... That's just it. Don't send me money, because if you do, I'm just going to spend it all on clicky animals. I'm going to bring so them to work all with of them. me. I do want all of them. The Squirky Special. This has been the Squirky Special. Yeah. Ta-ta! I'm literally just playing with toys now. <laughs> Hang on, I actually turn this off.